Now let's take a look at the uh, female reproductive system, and we're going to start at the same kind of place. So here we're going to start with the ovaries. These are the uh, primary reproductive organs of the female. Uh, they are the primary reproductive organs because they produce the eggs and the female sex hormones, estrogen, and progesterone. All right. Now, unlike uh, guys, you ladies are born with as many uh, eggs or uh, oocytes, which are immature eggs, as you're ever going to have. So you have about a million at birth. But more than half of these will degenerate by the time you get to puberty. So you only have about 400,000 at puberty. And of those 400,000 oocytes, immature eggs, you're only going to ovulate, release from the ovary, about four to 500 of those over your lifetime. And then a smaller percentage of those will be fertilized. All right, so let's take a look at the female accessory organs. So this is looking at uh, the female pelvis and sagittal section. This is like looking at it, uh, you know, uh, inside here. So here are the ovaries, and you see these tubes next to the ovaries, and these are called the fallopian tubes. They're also known as uterine tubes, and they're also known as oviducts. These are a pair of tubes leading from near the ovaries to the uterus, all right? So uh, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries are not directly connected. So the ends of the fallopian tubes lay over the ovary like so. All right. So uh, at the end of the ovaries, you see these like finger like projections called fimbria. And uh, these cover over the uh, ovaries and they guide the oocyte, which is the immature egg, into the fallopian tubes. Now, the fallopian tubes are where fertilization will occur. All right. So uh, just to let you know, let's go back to this previous picture. All right. So this is where you can see fertilization occurring. And this is the reason why so many uh, sperm are needed to be produced. So this is showing the vagina here, here's the uh, uterus, here's the fallopian tube, and there's the oocyte, which will become an egg. And then since the sperm are there, it's gonna be fertilized, and so we'll have a zygote then, all right? Now, uh, a lot of sperm get lost here in the vagina. Um, uh, some of these sperm uh, here are gonna take the wrong turn in Albuquerque, so they're gonna go to the side that does not have an oocyte. But the main reason why so many uh, sperm are produced is because this is a team effort to get a few sperm to the egg, all right? So this is not fluid filled. It's a moist environment, but not fluid filled. So when sperm get through the cervix and get into here, they are swimming through their own reproductive fluids that they're bringing with them, all right? So they can only go so far before they run out of that fluid and then other sperm cells behind them swim through the reproductive fluid that they left behind and then move a little further and the ones behind them move a little further and so on. So it's a really a big team effort to get, you know, by the time we get to the egg, we're only looking at a few hundred sperm getting there. In fact, if a guy has less than 50 million sperm per milliliter, he's actually considered to be infertile because he doesn't have enough sperm to make it to the egg. All right, so just to let you know, uh, sperm can live in the fallopian tubes for about six days. So if a woman has multiple partners or in that six, uh, the 24 hour period of her ovulation, uh, it could be any one of those guys. And this is what keeps Maury Povich in business. So uh, an ectopic pregnancy, if you have my notes, uh, I said that's where the embryo implants in the fallopian tubes, but ectopic just means in the wrong place. So it doesn't have to always be in the fallopian tubes. It typically is. They can also implant into the ovary. Uh, both of these can, be, can cause life-threatening situations for the mother because the ovary is not made to expand. Uh, it can tear. Uh, and so also if it implants on the ovary, uh, this can also cause internal bleeding. All right, let's look at the uterus. So here's the uterus there. So this is a muscular sac-like organ uh, where the embryo and fetus develop. Uh, and the uterus is highly distensible. So it's only about this big when there isn't any, uh, you know, embryo or fetus in it. And this can stretch to six and a half to nine pound babies is the typical, but you know, it can go to 10, 12, 13 pounds. In fact, the largest baby ever born was 23 pounds. All right, so let's look at the parts of the uterus. So the upper part here is called the fundus. So that's the part like above where the fallopian tubes enters. The majority area there is the body of the uterus, and then the lower third is the cervix. All right. Looking at layers, we have the parametrium, which is the outer serosal layer here. 
Uh, the middle muscle layer is called the myometrium. And then the end of lining is the endometrium. All right. So uh, this is where the embryo will implant into. All right. Now, um, I guess uh, let's, let's stay with that picture. If there is no fertilization that occurs, what's going to happen here is that embryo or that endometrium will be shed. And that's what the menstrual flow is. So the endometrium builds up for implantation. If there's no implantation, you shed that endometrium. If there is implantation, the embryo will implant in here about a week after fertilization. So it takes, at this point, the embryo at this point, takes about a week to move from the fallopian tubes uh, into the uterus and then implant. And once it implants, it's gonna secrete a hormone called human choranic gonadotropin, so or HCG. So HCG prevents menstruation because menstruation would shed the endometrium, so you would lose the pregnancy. So this prevents the shedding of the endometrium from occurring. Now HCG is also what is detected in a pregnancy test. All right, let's move on to the vagina. So let's move to, uh, back to a sagittal section here. So this is the vagina right here. There's the uterus and that sagittal section, vagina there, all right? So function of the vagina, one is it transports uterine secretions, so the menstrual flow there. Uh, it also receives erect penis during sexual intercourse and it provides an open channel for the offspring during birth. Layers of the vagina, we have a fibrous layer, which is hard to see here, but that's this layer right there. All right, it attaches the vagina to surrounding organs and tissues. We have the muscular layer right there, which is made of smooth muscle, and this helps close the vagina. And then we have a mucosal layer, which is the inner lining, all right? So the mucosal layer contains rugae, and that's what these little kind of ridges are trying to show there. And this is gonna stimulate the penis during sexual intercourse, all right? The mucosal layer is kind of misnamed uh, because it doesn't actually produce uh, a mucus per se, uh, and it's lubricated from cervical uh, glands up here on the cervix and vestibular glands, which are found in the vestibule, which is in this area here. All right. Next, uh, the mucosal layer actually secretes glycogen. Now, glycogen is eaten by bacteria that are that normally inhabit the uh, the vagina, and by uh, uh, producing that glycogen that the bacteria eat, the bacteria produce lactic acid as a byproduct of their feeding action, and that makes the vagina acidic. All right. So when I said uh, acidic secretion of the vagina. So, uh, you know, it's not a direct secretion, it's an indirect secretion here. But what that lactic acid does is it prevents uh, other infections from occurring in the vagina. So this is a mutualistic relationship. The bacteria uh, provide an environment that actually inhibits other microbial growth. All right. So, uh, and this can be a problem for some ladies, you know, if they uh, take antibiotics because antibiotics are indiscriminate killers of bacteria. So they can kill off the good bacteria that's found in the vagina and uh, open them up to another type of infection, like a yeast infection. All right. So uh, now let's look at the uh, external genitalia. All right. So here is the mom's pubis there. So the mom's pubis is this found, uh, fatty rounded area that overlaps a pubic symphysis, which is a uh, joint between the two pubis bones. Next is the labia majora. So this is the labia majora right there. So the labia majora uh, encloses and protects the other external reproductive organs, all right? Uh, it is made of the same, same embryological tissue as uh, the scrotum uh, of guys. So what becomes a labia majora on you ladies becomes a scrotum on guys. Next is the labia minora. So here's the labia minora inside of that. So these are flattened, to, uh, flattened longitudinal folds uh, between the labia majora uh, and they're going to cover the uh, vaginal and urethral opening. So there's the urethra. All right. Um, there uh, became, uh, so what becomes a, the uh, labia minora on the females becomes uh, part of the penis of the male. Next is the vestibule. So this area right here is the vestibule. So this is a space between the labia minora. All right. Uh, this contains the vaginal uh, and urethral openings as well it has vestibular glands. And these glands secrete a fluid that lubricates the penis and vagina during sexual intercourse. Uh, lastly, 
I don't know why that moved. Uh, lastly, here is the clitoris right there. So uh, this is a small protruding structure composed of erectile tissue. It is highly innervated, lots of nerve endings in it, and it uh, is very uh, sensitive to stimulation, and it contributes to female sexual arousal. Uh, it is made of the same type of erectile tissue that is found uh, in the uh, gland's penis. And it is of the same embryological organ, origin here. Uh, and because of that, uh, it will become erect as well. All right, uh, now let's take a look at uh, the mammary glands. So the mammary glands are the milk producing glands of the breasts. Um, uh, they are found in both sexes uh, and are actually modified sweat glands. So we look at this, the upper view here is showing um, inactive mammary glands and these are showing active mammary glands during the later stages of pregnancy and then after pregnancy. Now there's two hormones that are involved in here. Uh, one is prolactin, which causes milk production. And then the other is oxytocin, which helps move the milk through those duct systems. All right, so, um, so here it's a positive feedback mechanism. You get uh, uh, nipple stimulation, which will cause more prolactin production, which causes more milk production. Uh, and then, you know, if you have less nipple stimulation, you get less prolactin uh, production, uh, less milk production.